So why don't we get started? Um, let me just find the various buttons. Uh, sorry, Zoom is uh, defeating me today. But that's okay. Uh, all right, so let's get started. Uh, so DS100, we are gonna talk about life cycle and cause and effect today, um, and maybe a couple other things. Uh, first and foremost, okay, so uh, the homework is out. Um, I believe, right, you released it already. Um, the thing is, don't work on it yet. Uh, so I'm going to demo a little bit about how you would go about it today, um, but during the discussion session on Friday, uh, we'll make sure that all of you are all set up so that you can do the homework. Uh, you may have enough time even during the discussion section to do the homework. We'll kind of have to see how it goes. Um, so I recommend waiting until Friday. However, it is released. So if you are familiar with Jupyter Notebooks or with um, what's called the SCC, which we'll talk about in a bit um you can go ahead and start on it or other ways of using Jupyter notebooks uh so feel like no penalty for starting it early but i recommend waiting until friday uh for less pain all the way around um but we keep take their uh beautiful survey So the uh, our moderator events are also like the most misaligned, or mis or actually uh, maligned, sorry, not misaligned, uh, maligned pieces of software as well. Uh, for some reason, they get a really bad rap. Um, remember the slides will be released after the class, but this is a survey. We ask that you complete it before the start of the next lecture. Um, and it's a bunch of questions about, you know, who you are and what you want out of the class, but then a bunch of also, also random stuff like which uh, leg do you put your pants on first? Um, and the reason we do that is because then we can kind of use all of you and prior iterations of this class as input into data that we can use to, for analysis later. Um, I will say that while it does collect personal information about you, that will be stripped before it's used in any way. So don't worry about the privacy aspect. Um, we will make sure we take it out. Um, and that's the survey. So, you know, if you, if you play with it now, that's fine. Or like I said, you can certainly wait till after class. Uh, that might be a lot easier. It should hopefully take you less than 10 minutes to complete, um, but it's just a good way for us to basically create our own data set, right? And it's about all of you. And we'll use uh, the ones from uh, prior iterations as input. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about um, data science itself, okay? Uh, and so there is uh, this kind of process to what we're doing, right? So, and I've kind of mentioned this a little bit already. I'm going to turn my camera because I keep walking way over there. Um, but so the first thing we do is uh, try to frame the problem, okay? And uh, this is harder than it sounds a lot of the time um, because what you need is as, as when you're defining the problem, is you kind of need to know what are the inputs and the outputs, right? You need to really kind of carefully sit down and think about what it is that you're really trying to answer and try to remove extraneous information uh, that, you know, if you're just talking about it out loud, uh, can be uh, things that you would include when you're talking about it, but not really a part of the problem. Um, hopefully as I uh, walk through this, I'll think of a good example, but right now I'm not thinking of one, but uh, so, but then once we figure out what the problem is, right now we know what kind of input or what kind of data to collect to try to answer whatever our question is or solve our problem. Uh, and so we go and collect the raw data. And the reason I'm kind of giving you an overview here is because over the course of this semester, we're gonna talk about kind of how to get to each of these, 
So there's a, a number of different ways that you would collect the raw data, right? And so uh, we'll talk through kind of one example of that today um, and some of the problems with how you're collecting the data. Um, and then you want to process the data, okay? So now you've got to take whatever you collected and then run it through some set of algorithms of some kind, right? To figure out how does it solve the problem you're looking for. Um, so as you're processing that data, um, what you want to do, oh, sorry, and sorry, I actually misspoke. So you're not actually running through the algorithm yet. You're just kind of getting the data into a format that's usable. So this is um, a stage that is often called data cleaning. Uh, and it is the least glamorous component of this field of altogether. Um, but as you might imagine, right, when you're collecting information, either because you collected census data, right, or you, uh, you know, went and asked people on the street some question, you may not get the cleanest of data as it comes in. So the first thing you have to do is clean it up, make it uniform, such that you can process it. When you're doing traditional like statistics, this is, you know, arguably, of course, less important because humans can kind of look at the data and, and do the calculations and kind of correct it on the fly. Computers, and I will reiterate this probably a lot in this class, computers are stupid, really, really, really dumb, okay? They can only do the things that you tell them to. And if you don't tell them exactly what to do, they won't do it or they'll do it incorrectly, which is usually what we refer to as a bug, right? So computers are very, very dumb. And I think one of the temptations, people who are new to doing computing, like you know, programming, that kind of stuff, the temptation is to think that all this whiz bang software that they see means the computer is smart, but it's not. It's just really dumb. It just has a whole lot of steps, a lot, sometimes millions that it's following in careful chronological order so that it knows what to do next, okay? So least glamorous, often very time consuming, cleaning up your data. Then you explore the data, okay? So this is where I think data science is kind of closer to like a research field or like a software, or, sorry, or like a science field than it is then to general software engineering or programming in general. Because there's a lot of kind of thinking about what you're looking at and trying to figure out what is it, right? What, like when you're looking at that data, figure like trying to understand what the data is. And you can imagine if you have millions of records of data, that can be really challenging, right? Like you just, you can't conceive of the stuff that you're looking at. That's where we use tricks like graphs and summarization and sampling and things like that to try to understand what that data looks like. Um, and, and so that we can draw reasonable conclusions. Then you perform your in-depth analysis. So this might be using various algorithms um, and, you know, and just by way of background, right? An algorithm is just a series of steps, okay? But it sounds fancy, so therefore it's better. Um, but all an algorithm is, is something that someone has to find to say, this is how you get kind of from point A to point B. And you'll have a lot of different choices for algorithms, okay? You probably did some of this in, you know, some lo lower level school than university, you know, where you use things like Pythagorean's algorithm, right? Like there's lots and lots of different algorithms. It's basically just a mechanism, okay? When you talk about it in math, it usually looks like a formula, but that doesn't, it's not limited to a formula. So can anybody think of a, like a real-world example of an algorithm for a computer? I was going to say the social media algorithm. Yeah, so social media algorithms are really common. Uh, how many people here use TikTok? What is the single most, like, biggest complaint on TikTok related to TikTok, right? Is how does the algorithm work, right? How, how does the FYP work? So that is a good example from tech, but how about real-world example? Yes, okay, so again, that's a math example, which is in the real world. Um, so, and yes, however, I'm looking for something even more basic than that. Exactly, that is the one I was thinking of, Joss. Uh, so, when you're cooking something, there's a recipe. It's a series of steps, right? It also has a series of ingredients. So it has some inputs, it has some steps, and the output is hopefully delicious food. 
Sometimes it's the third or fourth try at the recipe that it comes that way. But you know, ostensibly, you're going to make something good out of it. Um, this the, that example I find particularly interesting. Um, if you uh, kind of uh, like step back from that a little bit and think about planning a dinner party. Okay, so if you're going to have a dinner party, you're going to have to figure out who all the guests are, then find out you know when they're free. Right, then you got to figure out uh, maybe there's food allergies amongst them, right? Maybe there's a disability amongst them. So you got to account for those. You've also got to think about, oh, well, you know, Jane really doesn't like Joe. So we don't really want to put them together if we can avoid it. So you want to make sure you do your seating placement correctly um, and think about that. And then you've got all the recipes for all the food. Some of it you might have to make the night before, some of it you make early in the morning, some of it you have to do last minute. So you have to plan all that stuff out. And the reason I bring this example up is because Cosmopolitan Magazine, is anyone familiar with that magazine? In, I believe, 1969, uh, wrote a cover page article, like a cover article, uh, encouraging women to get into software engineering and programming. And the reason they, they said that they should do this is because it was just like planning a dinner party, um, which I find both interesting and horrifying at the same time, um, because as you probably are where right there's not a lot of women in the software industry and a lot of that arguably is because when the a lot of hardware for workspace uh kind of focus shifted towards programming being almost more important or more uh you know much larger uh women dropped out of programming and men kind of took it over so follow, you know, follow the directions of Cosmo and, uh, you know, think about getting software engineering, a full-time job. Um, but I, I just, I love that example of an article. Um, and then finally, communicate the results. So we talked about this a little bit before. Um, when you're communicating the results, and we're going to talk in a second about a particular example of this, when you communicate the results, you got to be really careful that the person you're communicating with understands what you're saying, right? And I think I've said in this and every other class I've taught about a million times, English is very difficult. Actually, all spoken languages are very difficult. It's very difficult to know that what I'm saying is what you're hearing. So as a result, keep that in mind. You want to think about what the person consuming the information is taking away as well. All right. So this is just one of many examples like this. Um, but so. Uh, so if you drink free coffee today, there's a link to uh, having better kind of health outcomes, right? Um, and so what does this make you want to do? Drink more coffee, right? Um, but you, you got to admit, right, that this article, it's a link. It's not saying it's going to happen, right? So what we can look at is a different one, but this one's about chocolate, uh, where this headline is like, chocolate is good for you. So it's starting to sound like a stronger relationship. Um, however, either of these things is what we call causal. You know what causal means? Right, so cause and effect relationship. Instead, Actually, sorry, I'm, I'm ahead of my slides. Uh, so I want to talk about the observation. So what we do is we first go out and collect that data, right? So we go and go and find out people eating chocolate, right? And people drinking coffee three times a day. Um, and we figure out who those people are and we call them individuals or participants or study subjects or whatever, any word like that. Um, you know, if you hear any of those words, those are the, the things we're measuring stuff about, okay? But then we have what's called the treatment, okay? Anybody know what a treatment is? At least for me, most people, right, you think about medical treatments, okay? But treatment in this case, or kind of in the, in the broader sense, is really the characteristic we care about, okay? So we're not actually having a doctor prescribe eating chocolate we're actually asking people how much chocolate they already eat. Does that make sense? You understand the difference, right? Is that 
the treatment is the characteristic. It doesn't really matter what it is. Um, and it may be kind of externally applied or maybe something inherent to the person, uh, but we call that a treatment. And then finally, we get the outcome. And in this case, the, with the chocolate example, a reduction in heart disease. Okay, so in other words, when we see, when we look at people who consume chocolate, they also seem to have a lower incidence of heart disease than people who don't consume chocolate. So we move on to, okay, so that first observation, we can get to something like an association, it's called. Um, and so if I say keyword down here, this is a hopefully blatant hint that the kind of thing that you might see on say a midterm would be these definitions, okay? So I, if I use my, my cool little magnifying glass quite some time to make, so um, that's probably something you want to know the definition for. So an association is that we have discovered there's a relationship. It doesn't mean that one causes the other, it just means that there is a relationship, okay? So we have observed that people who eat chocolate have a lower incidence of heart disease. So in this particular study, right, which is what the previous news article was quoting, we see, okay, so among those in the top tier chocolate consumption, 12% developed or died cardiovascular disease during the study compared to 17% of those who didn't eat chocolate. So this seems like a relationship, right? However, we don't know that there's a causal, like a causal relationship, okay? Can anybody think of a reason why immediately, right? Immediately why, um, you know, chocolate consumption may be completely unrelated to heart disease? Maybe uh, chocolate's a luxury and so people that have more money are more likely to eat more chocolate and they're more likely to have less problems health-wise. So in other words, um, you know, and I'll kind of repeat it just in case, but, so just because someone eats more chocolate and has less heart disease doesn't mean that they might be making completely unrelated choices that also cause less heart disease, right? So they may be from a higher socioeconomic class, so therefore they're able to eat chocolate more often, but they also have a better healthcare outcome, right? Um, but it could be, you know, something completely ludicrous too, right? It could be that, you know, uh, you know certain par parts of Europe those uh, people genetically have a bias towards uh, less heart disease. And uh, one of those places, let's say, is near Switzerland. Switzerland consumes a lot of chocolate, throws off the whole thing, right? So in other words, we don't know necessarily if there's a causal relationship. And it's also much harder to control for. Um, and because of what are referred to as confounding factors, which I think is on a future slide. That's why I was hesitating. Um, so association. So the first thing we're going to do is kind of look at an example. Um, and so London in the early 1850s, uh, here is a drawing, right? Um, photography not really being a thing. Uh, so in the newspaper, you get a lot of drawings, um, not exactly the cleanest conditions. Uh, and so uh, that tended to lead to certain kinds of illnesses. Um, However, one of the beliefs that was very prominently held, right, was that smells were, or bad smells in particular, right, smells were the problem, okay? And this, this was so prevalent that it has its own name, okay? It's called a miasma or miasmatism, which is the belief that bad smells are the problem, or a person who uh, believes in this, which is a miasmatist, um, so given off by water, by water or rotting matter, let me try to merge those words together, um, and was believed to be the main source of disease. Uh, and you saw, these are some of the you know, quotes, right? That you would see pretty regularly about how to fix it. Um, the one I like the best is that uh, the smell of gunpowder is somehow better than other smells. 
So what you should do is fire off the, you know, huge amounts of gunpowder, I don't know, fire cannons or something, um, and the smell would be reduced. Um, for anybody who grew up in the US, uh, does anybody know the pocket full of posies, right? From nursery rhyme, I think, or is it a song? I can't remember. Um, but there's a, there's a little uh, song you sing as a little kid, um, and uh, it's called, it's Ring Around the Rosie, right? Where it comes from. Um, which is actually a whole discussion about Black Death, like the plague that most people don't realize, but a pocket full of posies. So in other words, posy is a flower that smells. You would literally take some posies and put them in your pocket. And because of the good smell, that would keep the illness away. Um, and what's particularly interesting about this, right? This is, this is science advancing and evidence thereof. Florence Nightingale, have you ever heard of her? Can somebody tell me what, what she did? Oh, I already said it. I gave it away. All right. But you have another answer? Yeah. So, founder of modern nursing, I forgot I've written on the slide, but hey, there was a gimme. Um, so, you know, like very, you know, very important in some ways to medicine, right? Um, and then this guy, Edwin Chadwick, who um, the general board of health commissioner. Both of them strong believers in this uh, method, or in this, uh, you know, that miasmas were were the problem. So, moving on. Um, well, so we'll, we'll set it up a little bit first. So, in the 1850s um, or 1840s, I guess uh, there was an outbreak of what's called cholera, which is a you know a, a disease that will kill you. Um, in London, so in England, and largely believed to be based on bad smells. And so um, I think it was this guy, but I can't remember uh, who was the big fan of the gunpowder thing. Um, and so the recommendation was they should just blow off a bunch of cannons uh, and that will reduce the smell and we can get rid of cholera that way. Um, I don't know if they tried it or not, but I can promise that it didn't work. Uh, so, this guy came along and said, I don't, I don't believe in this bad smell theory, okay? I think it's something else. I think it might be related to what the people are eating and drinking, uh, you know, who are catching this, right? So what he did, um, which in like kind of our modern era, I think seems really obvious, but was one of the first to do this, um, is he made a map, right? And what he did was, uh, this is a map of part of London, and all the black rectangles or squares or whatever are incidences of the death from cholera. And if there were multiple deaths in that house, he kind of stacked them up, okay? So that you can kind of get an idea of the incidents uh, in that place. And zooming a little bit so you can see. Um, and so you can see, like, this is a place you didn't really want to live, right? Um, you know, there, there are a lot of people dying from cholera there. Um, and then there were some other weird things that happened, right? So if you notice, um, I lost it. Uh, so somewhere around here, there's a brewery uh, where there's very low incidence of uh, people dying from cholera. Um, this workhouse, this is basically what we would call uh, in kind of modern terminology, what's called a, a core house, except the difference is the reason it's called a workhouse is you were poor, you were shipped off to this house and you had to work hard labor. Um, but if you notice, they also have a very low incidence of cholera. So what he started to notice though, was that because he thought it was related to food or drink, right? That these clusters were around deep pumps, okay? And these days you didn't have running water to your house. So instead you had to go to a pump every X amount of time, get water um, and bring it back or whatever, right? So the only way you get water was from these pumps in the city. Um, and so what he noticed was these clusters around the pumps. Any theories as to why the workhouse, which, you know, seems pretty close, why it wouldn't have that much cholera incidence? So it has no pump, but I mean, you can kind of imagine that it, that's not very far. Oh, it has its own pump, exactly. So it had its own supply of water. 
uh, and as did the breweries, and I can't find them now um, because they were making beer, right? As well as the fact that if the, you were drinking beer, it was probably killing off the cholera anyway. Uh, so you kind of had those two things combined, but so you didn't have a lot of incidents there. So one of the things that he also started to notice was, um, you know, that's the other map today. Losing the context a little bit. Um, but so if you notice down here, this pump though doesn't seem to have any problems around it, right? Um, and then one of the things that was also interesting was there's one of the pumps. Ah, I should have looked these better beforehand. Oh, this one here. Um, this one also doesn't really have anything bad going on around it. Um, however, as we'll discover later, it probably should. But if you notice, it's, the, it's at the end of a tall truck. So people weren't really going there. They were going to this pump over here instead because it was actually more convenient. Um, so basically, he started to notice that around certain pumps, there was a high incidence of cholera, and around other pumps, there wasn't. And then there are a couple of interesting outliers um, where, for example, I think it's these two up here. Those two are arguably closer to that pump, which does not have a whole lot of incidents around it, but there seems to be a lot right there. And it turns out that um, the, this older woman basically was moved by her kids to this house over here, um, and but didn't like the water from that pump. So her kids would bring her the water from her old neighborhood, basically. So super interesting. So th these were some of the things that he noticed um, and started to recognize that maybe there was a relationship. Um, and he's basically now he's he's determined an association, right? So that if you are getting water from these pumps, there seems to be a higher incidence of cholera. But what doesn't he know, right? They could also be all eating from the same, you know, food stand, say, right? So we need a little bit more to know that the water is necessarily causing the problem for uh, these people. Um, and what's particularly cool, right, is that because of this guy and, and his, he's basically thought of as the founder of epidemiology um, and arguably some levels of data science, uh, you know, they actually named the pub after him um, because that's what you do in England when something's famous. Um, and ultimately, what he did was he asked the city to take away the handle from the pump, but not using just the little information we have so far, not just using that association information. Instead, he was able to find a causal relationship. And we bring this up because for a long, long time, this pump remained, right? This is a relatively modern picture. Um, however, Graham, who is our TF, assures me that it's not actually there anymore. It's now in a museum. And he went and took that picture of it in the museum. So if you're interested in this story, you can uh, actually go and see the pump that was the problem pump and what kind of led to this whole way of figuring out problems. So in epidemiology today, as probably some of you have experienced significantly more than certainly I did when I was in college, this is how they figured out COVID, right? Is they use maps and they continue to use maps. They do it to figure out where the people are that are getting sick and they start to figure out, you know, is there a relationship between what they're doing or what they're not doing that is causing them to get sick? Um, one of the ones that's, uh, you know, the, the least safer work, but most common and fairly effective, right, is wastewater measurement. This is a big thing actually in Boston right now, um, is to look at wastewater measurement of COVID incidents and uh, use that to determine where the people are who have the most illness. Um, and so, and by then, you know, be able to extrapolate from that, what can they do about it? Um, and for a little bit of a break, we'll do something completely different. All right, any questions so far? All right, so the big thing I wanted to show is that 
these are associations, right? We know, we, we believe there's a link between these things. So now what we wanna do is try to figure out the cause. But before we do that, uh, I will show you the FCC, it's called. Um, and so the FCC is the shared computing cluster. It is a service provided by the RCS, because if we're in software or anything related to software, everything must be an acronym. Um, so RCS, which is the research computing services, I think. Um, and this is what we're gonna be using to drive our Jupyter notebooks. And the reason is, is because if we use something like this, which is a shared computing cluster, it's a, super cheap, as in you don't have to provide any resources yourselves at all. And B, it's a known quantity, right? So I know that if you use this system, everything that you're gonna be doing for this class is gonna work. So as I said before, feel free to use alternate solutions, but what we wanna do is we wanna support only ones that are, are using this one, just because then we can minimize the problem set you know, versus having to deal with Windows versus Mac versus Linux versus some installed version of, you know, some tool chain or something that we can't predict. So if you use this environment, everything gets a little bit easier. So I was just going to show you, if you go to this website, you all should have accounts. Um, and what you can do is you can go to this interactive apps menu and then go to Jupyter Notebook. And you kind of fill in these boxes. The first time you go here, all of this will be blank. Um, but you'll see in the instructions for discussion. Um, or actually, I would recommend if you wanted to use this now to take a picture of it now, because this is not in the slides, but you should be in the video. Um, but basically, you choose Python 3, and then you run this startup script. Uh, and then, which I know this is in the materials directory, that should be fun. Uh, and then you just choose kind of your home working directory and then how long you're going to use it. And then, you know, the number of cores, you just leave that at one, the number of GPU. Um, so just by way of background, right, number of hours, this is how long this instance is going to be around for. So set it appropriately, try to err on the smaller side. Um, number of cores. So this is the number of processors you need to use to run whatever operation you're doing. For pretty much everything in this class, one is probably enough. Okay. So in your computers, for example, you have one chip that probably has somewhere between four and eight cores embedded in. Okay. So it's basically the number of CPUs. GPUs, so this is graphical processing units in data science and machine learning and that stuff. Um, graphical or GPUs can often perform calculations faster because math. Um, but if you notice all the stuff that I do, I don't usually need a GPU. Um, and then this should be the only project you have as a choice, but this is the class, right? It's just the name of the project. Uh, and that's it. And then you click. And if we're going too fast or you're not following along, don't worry about it. This is what we will literally be doing during the discussion on Friday is setting this up and making sure that you have it all set correctly and that everything works. But then you just go and click the big launch button. And then you should get a panel like this, okay? That says, we're still cooking. And if you remain on this page, eventually it'll, oh, look at that. It'll turn into a panel that looks like this. It'll be green and it'll have a little connect to Jupyter button. Eventually, it will expire and it will look like this. Okay, so this is in fact the Jupyter notebook I used in class the other day. Um, but so it's expired, it's not running anymore, but it's telling me that I, I used to have it, right? So you basically just have those different states. If it's blue, it's not ready yet. If it's green, it's ready, and you can click on it. So we can go connect to Jupyter, and hopefully I don't have a final exam or something open. You never know. Nope, we lucked out. Uh, okay, so, and this is basically where I was the last time. And what I point out is a couple of things. 
One, that all the files that I had from the last time I used it are all still there. In fact, most of the time, not 100% of the time, but most of the time, even the things that I had open are still there. So that's why I say error on the timing to the smaller side for two reasons. One, it saves the university resources, it saves the world resources, um, but also um, because you know, you kind of can get back to your existing state really easily. And then lastly, the smaller the number of hours, not entirely, but if it's a smaller number of hours, the faster it will start. Okay. You know, if you ask for one that's a month long, it's probably going to take a few hours before it launches. All right. Does that make a rough round amount of sense? Like I said, I just wanted to kind of show it a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, the yeah, the options. Yes. Um, so that's what I'm saying is that if you looked at this screen, like I said, though, the nice part about it is that you only have to write it once and then it will remember it unless you change it. But yeah, it's all of these. Sure. Theoretically. But like I said, uh, maybe I'll just show a screenshot of it in the uh, slides when we post it. But we will we will hand walk you through this on Friday. So. You know, if you want to get ahead of the game, great. If you don't, that's totally fine too. But like I said, I like to break it up a little bit and talk about something else. Yeah. All right, back to the regularly scheduled programming. So how did Jon Snow, and not the Game of Thrones one, but this one, prove a causal relationship? Well, so what he did was he went and looked at where the water was coming from that led to the pumps that were being drunk from. All right. And he, in some ways, kind of lucked out. Okay. And there were two big companies, um, which are SVN and something else. Wait, no, SVN and, um, oh, and Lambeth, sorry. Um, so basically, some of the pumps were getting water from this organization, and some of the pumps were getting water from this organization, and some were getting it from both. Okay. So, what he could do because of this is that he could now compare the one set to the other, right? He could actually remove all those confounding factors and just compare that one group of, of people and where they're getting water from versus another group and if they're coming from like you know the same neighborhood they probably you know arguably not but probably have very similar um you know are very similar in every other aspect of their lives right it's just where which of those pumps that are getting water from um and as a uh, you know, if you, if you know London at all, but so one of these is getting water from the Thames basically below London, and one is getting it from above London. Anybody have any theories as to what happens to the water that's below London in the 1850s? Sewage, yeah. So wastewater went directly into the river, um, and so. I think it's these guys, um, for some reason, I cannot keep in my head which, which group is which, but I think it's these guys are taking water from the lower end uh, and all the people who are getting water from them are getting taller. So what he was able to do is make a comparison and looking at the treatments, right? Except in this case, the treatment is that they get water from, you know, company A versus company B. Right, and that's the treatment. So there was no medical reason, just 
this is this is the difference between these two uh, groups. Should have done this as a build slide. Um, and so what we will often do in this kind of scenario, and this one is where, if you have any knowledge of medicine, where I think it gets kind of confusing, is you'll have a control group and they don't receive the treatment. Okay, so when you talk about it in medicine, right, you often will have like whatever drug you're testing versus a placebo. And the control group will be the ones getting the placebo. Um, does everybody know what a placebo is? All right, can anybody explain what a placebo is? Right. So, so it's it's a fake version of it. Uh, what I think is particularly scary about some of them, right, is that let's say the the real treatment causes nausea, right? Uh, the fake treatment will often cause nausea too. So not only are you not even getting the benefit from it, but you also don't feel. Um, so placebos can be really dangerous uh, in the sense that there's all kinds of ethics wrapped around placebo. Um, but in this case, what we mean when we say it in kind of the abstract, right, is that the control group is one of the groups that has one of the characteristics, right? And then the other groups that you're comparing it to has the other one. So no one in here is getting no water, right? Or fake water or something. It's just, we just label one of the groups as the control. And so what Snow did was he argued, right, that there was no difference between the people in the houses who were getting, you know, who lived in getting water from one of the locations versus the other, um, aside from the water. And so that's how we can show a causal relationship is by controlling for what are called confounding factors or controlling for all the things that are not the actual treatment. And so what he did was he put a table together of the actual data. Um, and because if you remember in the earlier map, right, there was a, a part of it that was both. So he kind of threw those over here and kind of tried to take them a little bit out of the equation because one of these is the control and one is gonna be the one that you're doing a comparison on. Um, but this one obviously is too <laughs> muddy not to make too much of a pun. Um, to really use in either case, right? So what he noticed was that the number of houses they served was about 40,000. The number of deaths they had was about 1,200. Um, and then in Lambeth, or the people who were served by Lambeth, uh, they had 26,000 and 98 cholera deaths. So the first thing you do when you look at a table like this, right, is realize that you can't compare the numbers directly. Right? Because 98 out of 26,000 is a very different relationship than 1,200 over 40,000, right? Just because the nature of these numbers are so different. So, what you do is you start to build out like ratios, right? And so, if you look at uh, the S and B, um, that's why I think it's because I think that's an N and not an AM that I have such a hard time with the um, but so that 315 is instead of looking at it in, ter in raw numeric terms, we're actually going to turn it into a ratio so we can say, okay, so for every 10,000 houses, there's 315 uh, deaths and in the, other, in the other one, it's only 37. So that clearly means you don't want to be drinking their water, right? Um, although in the grand scheme of things, it's not actually a huge percentage. This is one of the things like they talk about with COVID is like, it's, um, you know, the, the incidence of illness is actually relatively small. It's just that the, the outcome is really bad. So while this is a relatively small number of, of the overall, it's still 1200 people who died, right? So, and not to mention the number of people who got sick and happened to recover. <laughs> so we wanna look at it in terms of like something that is comparable across the two. Um, and then if you think about, if you want kind of like, you want to know what maybe norm is, you can kind of look at something like the both um, where, but the, the problem I have with this particular example is just that 
both, it's not very clear what that means, right? Like, does that mean, you know, the pump is actually getting water from both sources at the same time, all the time? Or is it, you know, between the hours of midnight and six, it's getting it from one versus the other? So I think, I think there's a lot of those quote unquote compounding factors in this part. But if you, even if you just compare these two, it's pretty clear that Lambeth is the water you want to be drinking. Um, and so using this data, <coughs> Um, yeah, so using this data is what John Snow was able to use to convince the city to take the handle off that pump so that people would stop drinking out of the Broad Street pump. Um, and eventually, well, what it showed was that the deaths from cholera were, went down right? because they couldn't get the water from the bad pump. So they went to the other ones, which by, you know, by extension, I guess um, cholera itself was actually dying down a bit at the time, but there's but he is credited with saving lots and lots of lives just by taking the handle off the pump. Just so to kind of wrap that up, right? The treatment and the control groups are similar apart from the treatment, and differences between the outcomes of the two groups can be ascribed to the treatment. So if you compare the two groups and they have the same treatment, you know, or sorry, one has one treatment and the other one doesn't have it, and you don't have any other factors, then you can say that the treatment is the reason why it has it. I feel like it's, these slides still need a little bit of work because uh, now we talk about some founding factors. Um, so if there are systematic differences other than the treatment, then it's difficult to identify causality, all right? Um, and those are often present in observational studies. So yeah, so we'll talk, we'll talk about a simple example and some other ones. Um, so when you look at an observational study, does anybody have a theory of what an observational study is? It's right there in the terms. Go ahead. Yeah, it's like uh, you can do a study by observing stuff versus setting up a study and having. It. Exactly. So, so you just observe things, okay? Um, but we'll talk about why that can be problematic in a minute. Um, and if those factors kind of you know mess with your theories, they're referred to as confounding factors. All right. This is one of those one words where there's a, there's a number of words in English, right? They, I feel like they sound like what they mean. Confounding sounds like something that is confounding, personally. So hopefully it does for you, too. Um, so as you can see from this graph, people who eat ice cream get attacked by sharks. So don't eat ice cream <laughs> is the conclusion. But this is confounding factors, right? Because Clearly, there is not actually a causal relationship between ice cream consumption and shark attacks. There probably isn't one the other way around either. You know, if you get bitten by a shark, you tend to like ice cream. Um, so, but this is a great example where it just, you can't, just because it happened doesn't make it true or it doesn't make it causal, I should say. Um, and then we'll talk about another one in a minute, um, but I was just going to give another example with the confounding factors. So for example, and why observation can be difficult, let's say you are trying to figure out if the popularity of, actually we can say ice cream, right? Um, and when you are basically trying to do your observational study, you say, all right, let's go someplace and we'll just ask people if they eat ice cream. Now, what do you think the result will be if you go outside of an ice cream shop and ask people if they like ice cream versus if you go, say, outside of a bar and ask people if they like ice cream? What, what, will, what will the likely difference be? Exactly. So, so your observation is influenced by your environment. You know, sometimes. You know, like ice cream, though, wouldn't they be in the ice cream first? 
I meant walking in, but yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so in other words, when you're doing your observation, like kind of how you're doing the observation uh, can have a significant impact on the result that you measure, right? Um, you know, my, my other terrible example is like, you know, do you work for the city of Boston? If you're hanging out at, in front of city hall, you probably get a lot more positive answers than if you are, you know, at the BU quad, right? So those things come into play. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about like, so how do you, how do you get around that? Okay. What you do is you introduce what's called randomness. Okay. And so this is kind of a joke, but so you roll a die and you often need to roll a die. Uh, this is a great way to resolve the problem of, I don't know, five roommates who are trying to figure out where to have dinner um, and nobody can decide which place to go to. So you roll a die and that's how you pick whether you're going to have Indian food or you're going to have, uh, you know, uh, Thai food. Um, so rolling a die. One of the things I want to point out, though, is that randomness in computers is actually very difficult. Okay, As you might imagine, because I said earlier on, um, computers are really, really dumb. So one of the things they can't do, right, is think on their own. Can anybody here explain to me the steps required to get a random number? Right? There, there's no pathway, there's no algorithm for that. You just have to think of a random number. So a lot of computers these days to, well, there's two things that they do. In most computers, if you ask for a random number, you get what, what's referred to as a pseudo random number. So it's kind of random because it used an algorithm to figure out what the random number should be. So it's gonna be kind of random. Usually they're based on the time, right? Um, because that's something that's relatively random that you can then extrapolate from. Um, more recently, they actually do cool tricks like they'll actually pull the temperature of the computer and use that to calculate your random number. So that it's completely, that really is completely random what the temperature of the computer is at any given moment. Um, so the reason I pointed out is just that when you're rolling a die, if you're rolling a die like this on the internet, that is actually probably way less random than actually rolling a die. Which is kind of funny that computers don't do certain kinds of things really well. So why do we care about randomness? Well, because instead of hanging out in front of the ice cream shop or hanging out in front of the bar, instead, if we maybe picked a place at random to do our ice cream survey, okay, then hopefully we can get a more you know, realistic sample of using observation. Same is true with the government employee, et cetera. Um, but what we wanna do is introduce randomness into how we discover um, who our participants in it are, you know, how, what we're calculating, all those kinds of things, so that we know mathematically, and we'll talk about the math for this in a future lecture, for the variability of the assignment. So we actually know like why you know this particular person ended up or, or thing or whatever we're observing um, ended up in one group versus the other uh, and how they you know and, and what caused them to get there. And if we can kind of show that that's a that's random, then there we go. It's a good thing. Um, and so again, I like to, uh, to you know offer the questions that have the stunningly obvious result. So if we're doing an experiment, what kind of experiment would it be if we have random control around how they get into the or into the into the groups? Any ideas? You'll, you'll find this very difficult when we get to it. A randomized controlled experiment, right? So, and this is a very important set of words, right? Is that the experiment we're doing? And we call them experiments when we're looking at all these groups of people or whatever that we're looking at. Um, and then we control the randomness, right? We control like uh, we control how they get into the groups using randomness, or how we sample from them, or whatever. 
All right, but one big thing that is tempting is that when you use the term random in English, that is often synonymous with haphazard. When we're talking about it in data science, it's not haphazard. Just because something is random doesn't mean it's like all over the place. It means that we have set up a controlled experiment and we've introduced a random you know, assignment to groups or a random location that we're gonna collect our data from, but it's all very controlled. It's not, we're not just like picking randomly out of a hat or whatever. We're, uh, sorry, that's actually probably a good way to do it. Um, it's, we're looking at what are we trying to control for? What are we, what are our confounding factors? What are the things that we wanna use for our treatment? Who are we observing? Uh, and we're <clears throat> introducing randomness to make sure that the groups we set up are randomly distributed so that we can control for things like, you know, when we talk about the houses that got cholera versus the ones that didn't, we know they're all equally likely to be getting food from the same places. They're equally likely to have the same kinds of work environments. They're equally likely to be, you know, uh, how often they walk during the day versus not walking, you know, all those kinds of things. Uh, so we can control for that. And so we randomly put them in there. And while the, the water example may not appear random, it is because the people who chose where they live, most of the time, very likely, didn't choose where they live based on their water provider. Right? So they're essentially random. They just, you know, Jon Snow just walked out that that's how that kind of thing happens. Does that make sense? All right. And then um, if you are unfamiliar with SKCD, um, it is very nerdy, uh, but often very funny. Uh, and so you will probably see a lot of their comic strips. Um, I actually brought up Calvin and Hobbes in another class today, uh, which also can be very nerdy, um, but is also very funny. Um, so I just kind of like this joke is that, you know, I used to think correlation implied causation. I took a stats class, but now I don't think so. The other guy says, you know, sounds like the class helped, right? So, but I think with that, unless anybody has any questions, I think we are done for today. I seem to